Hello and welcome to another video from Flash Jazz Cat. And in this video we have got an Atari 600XL. So that's a nice change from Atari 800XLs since in prior videos it seemed that this channel was in danger of becoming the Atari 800XL channel. We had four on the trot that covered Atari 800XL. So here we are with uh, 600XL. Now this happens to be my favourite uh, Atari 8-bit machine. They're absolutely beautiful little computers. And this one that's been sent in um, for a monitor jack and uh, an ultimate one megabyte installation and a 64K upgrade as well is particularly nice. It's in more or less mint condition. It's just absolutely blemish free, pretty much blemish free as far, as far as I can tell. The finish on the console keys is very, very unusual. It's hard to actually see it on the camera. I've never ever seen console keys like this before. They are totally, they've got a high gloss finish on them. So I don't know if that's original or if it's sort of been done after the fact because this is a bit of trim at the top here it doesn't kind of match the finish of the rest of the buttons and the first thing I noticed when I opened the box on this machine is this satin sheen on the on the keys is very reminiscent of the Atari 1200 XL keyboard um, it's very fetching it's really it really is a nice looking keyboard I have taken the lid off already but uh, anyway so this being an NTSC machine the reason one of the reasons it's been sent in is because it doesn't have a monitor jack and it's, it's missing quite a bit of the circuitry actually to drive the monitor jack so we're going to take the channel switch off here and we're going to fit the monitor jack but that'll involve cutting a hole in the back of the case for the jack but it, I mean it's going to look completely stock as per the PAL uh, machine. Then we'll be able to plug a monitor into it. Even with the monitor jack the stock uh, PAL machines they only had composite video the chroma and luma wasn't uh, hooked up at all. But uh, let's take the lid off anyway. I'm going to have a quick look at what kind of keyboard this is. But before we do that, let's have a word from our sponsor, PCBWay. Now, as well as being your one-stop shop for PCB prototyping and production, PCBWay also have a very interesting retro stuff section on their website. And for all the Atarians out there, and I'm sure you're one of them, they have products like the 4-in-1 OSS cartridge, the Atari 8-bit Pico cartridge, an Atari Sally breakout PCB for the Ultimate 1 megabyte, and even a replacement case badge for an XE. So if you're interested in any of those or any other retro items, or you just want to prototype PCB, pop on down to PCB Way today. It looks to me like it's um, a Stackpole keyboard. Although I can't see a, I think that's Stackpole, SCC, SCCOCO, Rev3E. I think that's a Stackpole, so it's a Mylar keyboard. Uh, the Mylar is looking a bit rough actually, but uh, hopefully it's uh, all working. And uh, it is a very, very nice looking keyboard that. Um, I've never seen anything quite like it. I thought I'd seen all the 1200XLs, but uh, I keyboard wise. But clearly I haven't. But this, yeah, this sheen on the on the console keys, it looks almost as if they've been varnished. The uh, cartridge bay doors are very glossy as well. But yes, I'm particularly fond of the 600XL. I've got, well, I counted them up the other day. I've got four, well, five if you count the one with a completely ruined motherboard and a missing keyboard. That's just really a breaker machine. I've got four. Two are in really nice condition. One is the uh, my kind of daily driver, actually. Oh, I've got it down here because I've been working on it. I've now renovated this one and I've got the lid off this one as well because I've been using it as a reference uh, machine for reasons that will become obvious uh, in a bit. Um, but this is mine. Uh, now this one has quite a few upgrades inside of it. Now I just renovated this the other week. I thought I'd take a bit of time for myself for a change and uh, spend a couple of afternoons sorting this out. This is one of the first, mach first machines I actually upgraded for my own purposes anyway. Probably one of the first machines I ever installed Ultimate One Megabyte and VBXE in, actually. You're probably talking about 2010, 2011, or thereabouts when I originally did the work on this thing. So obviously as time has passed, when I work on customer machines now, I'm constantly looking at my own Ataris and thinking, why do the customer machines always look so much nicer than my own stuff? So I thought, that's enough. So I... Uh, I retro brighted the case. We actually had a bit of sunshine in the UK the other week. It was quite short-lived anyway, but the case had gone a little bit yellow. So I did that. 
I completely dismantled the keyboard, cleaned it down to the PCB level, cleaned all the individual key keycaps. Somebody donated me another Alps keyboard because this is an Alps keyboard and um, the keyboard was in pretty poor shape but the console keys were nice so I, I stole them off the spare keyboard, I polished the perspex, uh, refinished the cartridge B doors, I need to put some uh, satin lacquer on them as well. The satin lacquer I had, the tin had completely blocked up so I need to remember to seal them. Um, but yeah, I mean it looks okay. This had the uh, the flex cable on the keyboard's been replaced. I did that quite some time ago. I'll probably replace that again. But the keyboard's quite nice. It did used to be my favourite uh, Atari 600XL keyboard or XL keyboard in general because you'll, you'll see the various sub-variants of keyboard. Uh, High Tech, Mitsumi, Stackpole, Alps, EWC. I think they are the five main ones. You'll see them more or less randomly appearing in 600XL and 800XL, 800XL computers. This is one of the Alps keyboards. They are one of the nicer ones, but what I've noticed over time is that the switch has become a bit, the, the sort of recoil on the switches on the springs, they can get a bit spongy after a while. Some of them are okay, and other ones they're a bit kind of reluctant to come back up uh, I don't know if there's a way to sort of spray switch cleaner in the switch perhaps I don't think I've got any at the moment I need to get some maybe that'll loosen them up a bit then the finish on the key caps is okay now it's uh, could could look a bit nicer but uh, generally speaking I'm fairly happy with it or, or I was fairly happy with it until I saw Bertrand's a uh, decent XE keyboard, well, the, the version that he's brought out for the, the XL machine. Uh, I did a video a while ago about the decent XE keyboard, and I put one in a, an Atari 130XE with a sort of Falcon, Atari Falcon style keycap colouring. And initially, I was supposed to be, I hopefully I still can, get into manufacturing and selling these keyboards, uh, which Bertrand uh, kindly suggested uh, I might do. But of course, we moved house and there was absolutely no way I was going to have time to get into manufacturing these keyboards last year. Uh, maybe this year, hopefully, we'll, we'll find time to do that because I would really like to. And of course, Bertrand's been busy. Uh, he's, you'll know him as screaming at the radio uh, on uh, social media and on the Atari Age forum. He's got a YouTube channel as well. I'll link to that in the description below. I highly recommend you check his videos out. But he... Subsequently, anyway, he designed XL versions of this keyboard, and of course it uses modern switches, modern keycaps, and the XL versions of the keyboard, he's done a 1200XL version now as well, but he sent me a picture of one of his 600XLs the other night with the aftermarket keyboard in with the big return key and the modern switches. Looks absolutely fantastic, and obviously it's going to have a fantastic feel, logistic-wise, it's, it's going to be great. So I really want one of those keyboards for this machine. I think it deserves it. I really it is my favourite little 8-bit Atari. And I think I'm going to have to put myself together one of these um, nice XL keyboards. And it's going to really lift uh, this computer, I think, uh, to have a nicer looking keyboard. But it still looks very much in character. It looks very nice. So that's my 600XL. There's enough room for a, a modest uh, set of upgrades in here. There's still a bit of room left. Uh, but you can see on this machine anyway, if we look down here and we compare it with the motherboard uh, of the customer machine here, there's a big empty gap here. We've got the channel switch up there and we've got some missing components here. There's two areas of missing components actually, but we'll focus on this one at the moment. This is for the monitor output. Now if we look at my 1200XL at the back in the same area here, we see we've got lots of components there so that's what we need to populate on the customer's board now this other area at the front here so that area there that's the, that's for the PAL color burst circuit we're not going to need this on, in this case because the customer's machine is NTSC and it's going to stay NTSC Atari made these motherboards in a highly flexible manner um, not so with the 1200XL which was never available in a PAL variant although you can mod it um, as such uh, but the 600XL, 800XL and the XE range after them, they all had locations for components so they could either be produced as a PAL variant, uh, an NTSC variant and in the case of the 600XL the monitor port, due to basically due to space constraints uh, on the motherboard, was optional. 
uh, and it wasn't present on the NTSC machine. So all the NTS the NTSC 600 XLs, as far as I can surmise, they would be supplied uh, with neither of these areas of circuitry populated. Uh, because if it's NTSC, it automatically follows that it doesn't have a monitor port on the back. But under this channel switch here, if we take this off, as you'll see later on, we do have vias and traces uh, for the monitor jack. We don't have traces for chroma and luma. You need to add them regardless of whether it was a PAL or NTSC machine and whether it originally had a monitor jack. But we do have all of the vias and everything we need to put the monitor jack in place. Probably the trickiest part, certainly for somebody who's not doesn't have a flair for that kind of thing is going to be cutting the hole in the back of the case fortunately i'm pretty well practiced in that sort of thing so we're going to make it look pretty much stock uh hopefully but uh yeah so that's um that's the difference between the pal board and the uh the ntsc board so uh yeah so nice little machine you could act, you could probably go further with the, the upgrades in this thing but i don't want to because it's very stable this machine very dependable and it has benefited from um just having a bit of a refit if I, if I take the motherboard out so when i initially modded this machine all those years ago about 13 14 years ago when i've put the uh din 13 connector here for the vbxe video output and certainly uh the Savo board, which I've covered in previous videos, that would have made this unnecessary, actually. But anyway, I've fitted a DIN 13 connector and I've, I've actually drilled the holes for the legs in the board. Necessarily, there was some traces that actually went straight through where this, uh, the legs for these, um, this connector needed to be. So when I initially did this, I just ground off the, the traces on the bottom of the board and I had big lengths of wire going over here jumpering um, the signals moving them around the, the side of the connector now when I redid it the other week I took all those bits of wire off actually they were getting a bit janky and the machine was glitching now and again and I've gone in and I've used I, I, try, I was going to use magnet wire but I didn't have any on me at the time so I just used some long component legs and I've just rebuilt those traces around the uh, site of the connector there completely rewired everything I've, this is all new wiring here new shrink fit tubing uh, so it looks a lot cleaner without all of that extra wire hanging off the back these are the jumpers for the um <coughs> the chroma and luma signals that we are going to add to the customer's machine once we've got the monitor jack in place so this is a, this is a good reference point this capacitor I, I found it was necessary on my 600xl for the chroma signal it was just a little bit dirty or a little bit overpowered so just putting a low value ceramic cap there really smooths things out a bit so that's the chroma yeah that's the luma and this one here is the c-sync signal for the vbxe which is going over the vbxe jack that that's got a resistor in it it should really have a resistor a, a voltage divider on it but it's just got a little resistor there just to because my tv it's a bit fussy with the the signal level on on composite sync so that i found that stabilized it quite well but we won't we probably won't need well we certainly won't need that on the customer machine because he's not getting vbxe uh, and we almost certainly won't need that capacitor on the customer's machine either <laughs> i may have actually done a video mod and changed a few components on my 600 xl some years ago um so i'm not using that as a reference uh for the the, the video circuit that we're going to populate but maybe maybe that's the reason that, I, that i've had to balance things out with this capacitor but it almost certainly won't be necessary it's almost never necessary uh, on the 600 xl which has uh, out of the box among the nicest video that you will see on an 8-bit computer an atari 8-bit computer but one thing you need to do is remove uh, the capacitor that's just at the top left corner of that uh, cd4050 chip there because that's like a, it's a blurring cap it has the effect of blurring the image it was probably put there to minimize uh, the effect of any kind of graininess on the image or any any jail bar effect or anything like that but there the, the, the generally isn't any such thing on the uh, 600 xl signal anyway so we can take that cap off and i always take that cap off uh, when I have a 600 XL through my hands here, but you can see there's so much, there's so little space here in, in, in this board 
that all the video circuit, uh, this area of the video circuit, all the components are up on their end. So um, stealing these components from, say, an 800XL isn't really an option, and I don't really want to start cannibalizing the other 600XLs in the collection. So I've had to inventory the parts. Hopefully I've got them all, because you need long uh, component legs, because one side, one side of the component's going to have a long leg going down, down its length into the board. So it's quite quite a tight fit but it works fine and, uh, and for all that cramped nature of the the circuit footprint there the video quality is really really nice and this is another uh, 600xl board belonging to me from the collection it's missing a couple of bits and pieces um and you can, as you can see the the case has gone quite nasty on this one but it, that can be fixed this is a pal machine as well so this one i've done nothing whatsoever to this one it's still got that capacitor the little orange one up there which uh, blurs the image horribly so that's going to be taken off it hasn't even had uh, a 64k ram upgrade or anything this one at all so this is a great uh, reference board uh, that we can use to ensure that we're getting things right when we put this uh, video circuit in the customer's machine so the customer's machine here it's in very nice condition it's very very clean uh, for some reason there's a screw missing at the top right there on the, on the SIO port and that looks suspiciously like the screw that's supposed to be there so I don't know what's going on. So somebody's been in here before and, and we can tell that anyway because the top shield was never in the machine although the bottom shield is still there. Is this a Chelco board? The, the Chelco boards are always very nice and you can usually spot a Chelco motherboard by the fact it's got the SIO connector screwed down onto the motherboard rather than attached with little pegs. But I'm going to take the board out anyway. I'm pretty sure, as I say, that this screw here uh, is supposed to be, although maybe not, there's supposed to be a screw there anyway, so that, that's gone. So I'm just going to drop these screws in the little plastic tub that I've got on the desk expressly for that purpose. That, now, yeah, so this screw here, this isn't, this isn't a, a tapping screw. That looks like the screw that's supposed to be on the other side of the... SIO connector and should have a little nut on the other side of it so I don't know what it's doing in there. So somebody's been in here and they've faffed about and they've got screws in the wrong places and stuff like that because they aren't really the correct screws in the correct position. This one is because there's a brass thread grommet in the motherboard there I believe but the other one is not. So it should come out, oh no, we've got another two, these are non-standard as well, these screws at the front. Oh no, no, they're not, well, they, no, they have got grommets in. So these, yes, these are, in fact, I correct myself there, these are standard screws. But that one, I think that one's supposed to be a self-tapper. Right, so now it should pop out. They're quite difficult to get out, these motherboards, and especially when the shield's in the case, there's a strong chance of injury on the shield. On the edges of the metal so hopefully we can get this out without doing ourselves any damage and put the power switch on that might help a little bit there's so many sharp edges sticking out here it's absolutely awful so we've got a bit of purchase on the bottom there there we go Ugh, and the board is out so now we can see what's going on so yeah that screw hole there that has not got a brass thread on it so that that was the wrong screw there we'll just leave the shield in the bottom of the case there's no immediate hurry to get rid of it although i probably will remove it when we put the ultimate one megabyte in the machine so can we see any evidence of the manufacturer here no it's not a chelco board by the looks of things that's very interesting indeed i don't think it is a chelco i can't see anything any makers marks that suggest it is i'm quite surprised because it really did look like a chelco board this one i can't get the this has been sort of burned on that's quite unusual as well. But yeah, it's in lovely condition. It's a very nice motherboard. And I noticed with interest as well that there's a, a big uh, capacitor at the back of the board here. And I, on my board, there's a smaller one at the back rather than this one. So there's a position, there's actually vias on the board for two different capacitors near the input jack here. Didn't notice that before, but all the boards are like that. So I don't know why, what decision making goes into which size capacitor goes in here fit the physical size of it because it's a 470 mic i think they always are so this one here has got the capacitor at the back and the 
two holes at the front are left unoccupied and this one's got the capacitor at the front. Maybe it's just whatever they had in the parts box on the day. As usual on the Atari Age forum, somebody has already done this and they've documented everything which is very very useful. Um, I spent quite a bit of time uh, the other night putting this little box of bits together because <laughs> my parts box is very disorganized at the moment. That's, that's one of the things I'm going to address as I get more and more well organized in the new house is uh, having all the different resistor and capacitor values easily to hand but at the moment they're not so it, it took me well over an hour to put all those parts together there's a couple of resistors that are, have quite unusual values but generally speaking I think I've got most of it but I'm going to double check it against this um, forum post at Atari Age which I'll show you uh, in fact Right, so I found this um, post on the Atari Age forum from, blimey, 14 years ago nearly. And this person is going to do exactly the same thing as I'm about to do here. I only found this after the event. The, the photographs are a little bit on the dark side, but you can see, you can at least make out the silk screen, so it gives you a good indication of what's where. So I've downloaded these photographs and uh, I'll be referring to them, no doubt. Um, Sloopy came along and he annotated the picture a little bit more which is quite useful we could probably do with a nicer photo so uh, probably a good thing to do before we continue I'll take a picture of the board and we'll try and come up with a, a nice annotated photograph so that I can put it on the website and people can download it so we don't have to go through this rigmarole all over again now I've cross-referenced all this with the schematic now I know the uh, schematics tend to have errors in them but this this person's established that one of the caps is one nanofarad it was fairly hard to figure it out from looking at the board this uh, 3.9 picofarad i can't find one i've got a i've got a, th a 3 and a 4.7 i think I, i'm sure either of them are going to be sufficient uh, they were even difficult to locate online but i'm sure somebody will come up and say that they've no way to get them from so anyway further down the page he's done a complete inventory of everything here which is very very useful and uh, there was a certain things I could, I, you can actually pinch off donor boards uh, like the three transistors the ferrite coil they're fairly readily available but once again the problem that you're going to experience if, you, if it's pulled off a donor board as mine is uh, is making it fit because I've got usually what both of the legs are trimmed fit pretty short so well, well, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it Right, so I'm removing all the solder from the vias on the area of the board uh, that we're working on here. I've flooded it with Amtec flux to begin with and then I've just added leaded solder over the top of what was already there. And this makes it uh, a lot easier for the wick uh, to pick up, uh, to pull that solder out of the vias as you might see here. In fact, I'll zoom in. The board's lost a bit of heat now. Right, so I'm going to actually add a little bit more to these ones. I just kind of rub the iron along the top just to work that solder in and in so doing that I've put a bit of heat into the board so hopefully when I apply the wick the solder comes out pretty easily. So I'm not really having to work too hard on these to uh, to get the solder. You could, I could use the desoldering gun actually on this, I suppose, but that's uh, it can be a little bit brutal the the desoldering gun. So I I kind of prefer this. And don't be afraid to uh, flip the board over if you think you're uh, labouring the point a little bit on the top. <sighs> okay, so I lost patience a bit. There's three vias are actually attached to a ground big ground pad ground plane so I'm just going to do them with the uh, desoldering gun I could have probably done a whole lot with this actually but uh, a lot of people don't have tools like that so I thought it would be a good idea to demonstrate doing it with desoldering braid yeah that's why I don't like using the desoldering gun because the, the bottom pad on that one is actually uh, bit in the dust but it won't matter because of course the it's only attached to the uh, ground on the bottom side so it just shows you how careful you need to be 
And while we've got the uh, soldering gun out, I think we might as well take the channel switch off if it will actually fit round the legs. Which it won't. We can just uh, heat these up and wiggle this out without damaging anything. Hopefully. There we go. And then we'll just wick out the solder there while it's still nice and warm. I mean, truth be told, we don't really need to uh, wick the solder out of those holes because we're not going to use them. And of course, since we're going to fit the monitor jack, we do need to clear all of the other uh, vias here that have already got solder in them. You know what, I'm going to fill those back up actually. <laughs> it's bothering me that I took the solder out of them when I didn't need to. So we're just going to put it back. Because that's how it would be out of the factory if the uh, monitor jack was actually fitted. Now we can clean this up and see what it looks like. Okay, so we've uh, got all the holes cleared there. As you see, we lost uh, just the top of the plate through on that one there. I'm not feeling too great about that, I have to say. I, I definitely overworked that one, but that that is attached to ground on the bottom side of the board. So it doesn't matter. It's just really aesthetics, I suppose. Um, but everything else is uh, cleared out quite happily. If we look at the bottom of the board, likewise, no problems there. So this is all ready for the new components. While I'm about it, I'm going to take that. Uh, um, I'm going to take that capacitor off that we're going to remove anyway. And there's the uh, underside of uh, where we're going to put the monitor jack as well. So uh, I'll just take that cap off, which is that one there, and then we'll be all set. And needless to say, this cap's attached to ground as well. Everything is attached to ground on this board, just to make life more difficult. Okay, so there we go. So the offending capacitor, which lived just to the top left of that chip, is now gone. So we're now ready to populate this part of the circuit using hopefully all the correct component values. And uh, then we should have video on the monitor jack. Okay, so I've started to put the components in here, off camera. Um, I've just done this row at the back here, and then I've just uh, continued along right to left here. So it's pretty straightforward. You just have to bend the uh, component leg back over itself. I'm following the sort of uh, consistency of what's already on these boards. I have the, um, the gold stripe at the top. So, and then just push it through here. Pretty perfectly straightforward. Push it in. And then we'll splay the legs out on the back of the board to hold it in position when we solder it in. I'm kind of doing them one at a time. You could, if you're in a hurry, you could uh, put several in at once and then just solder them all at once and then trim them at the same time. Doesn't really make any difference. So I'm going to, I'll use the magic of uh, editing to uh, speed through this process because it's going to be a bit tedious. And uh, when I've got the circuit completely populated we we'll put the monitor jack on and see what we should at least get uh, in the first instance before we do any we add any patch wires or jumper wires is uh, composite video so we should get composite video out the machine pretty much straight off the bat Right, so excitement prevails now because we've uh, reached the point of uh, having finished uh, installing the extra components. One or two of them are a bit off, to be honest. Uh, I didn't have a 3K uh, resistor, so I used a 3.3. If that turns out to be a problem, um, I'll change it over. But I, I, can't, I can't see it being, to be quite honest. Some of these value, a couple of them are quite uncommon. Um, I've ordered some replacements. Uh, on eBay for ones that I've had to pinch off the other board, uh, but most most of these components are just brand new. Um, the transistors are pulls off a donor board. I've got plenty of them, as is the coil. I just managed to get the leg of that inductor to reach the board at the back there uh, when I bent it over. But what we can do now, anyway, is put the um, monitor jack on and this is I've, I've got a few of these I've, I've managed to by trial and error sort of get the right one 
that's got the right footprint. And I've had these for a while. Um, I should probably buy some more actually, but that's just going to push in there like that and solder in. Obviously, we want to make sure that the jack's nice and straight. So we'll solder that in. All right, so there's the monitor jack on the board. I'll show you the, from the top side as well. And there we go, all soldered in. So let's have a look and see if we get, at this point, composite video. Okay, here we go, switching on. Oh, and we have, we've got a picture, brilliant. It's very, very difficult to see uh, in, the, in this particular sort of studio light. Well, there we go, you can see that a little bit better now. It's very murky because of course it's composite video, um, as you would expect. But uh, the colour and everything looks reasonably good. So I think we're on the right lines here. So um, that's a good start. So we've got composite video coming out of the 600XL new monitor jack now. So that's great. So I think the next thing we'll do, we'll add the uh, the jumpers for the um, S-Video. So Luma and Chroma. And then we'll swap the connectors around and see, if we, see how nice this uh, video looks. I'm hoping it is going to look nice. Uh, if it doesn't look nice, it's probably because I've because of one of these substituted component values that I've put in. So fingers crossed, it's going to look good when I add these wires. So I'll do that next. I've already got a video covering the uh, S Video mod for the 600XL, but I'll go over it again here. That's no problem. I've just noticed something else unusual about this board as well. Uh, that the quite a lot of the resistors. I've just it just occurred to me some of them on the video circuit as well over here, but quite a lot of the resistors. Are installed in a very um, haphazard fashion and they look quite a bit bigger than the normal sort of quarter watt uh, carbon film resistors there's these big fat resistors here they probably look like they're sort of higher rated uh, for current these resistors so it's a really unusual board this one it's very very strange indeed I've never seen anything quite like it let's continue and add these uh, Luma and Chroma wires on the bottom side of the board. And of course Atari helpfully uh, tied the, um, I think it's the Chroma pin, to ground. So we need to cut that first because we're not going to get uh, any um, S-Video colour out of the machine at all until we do that. I don't quite know why they did that, but uh, I've got a theory that it's uh, to do with monitor cable compatibility with the Commodore's. The Commodore machines but uh, I've got absolutely no way to substantiate that whatsoever but that, that appears to be cut so now we can go ahead and uh, fashion a couple of wires all right so Luma needs to be attached uh, via a 75 ohm resistor so I'm just going to tin that and the pickoff position uh, it's a bit fiddly but it is where is it it's the junction of these two components here just to the, just to the left of this little infilled ground area so we're gonna fill that like that so i've just attached the 75 ohm resistor just down here i've mounted it this way on uh, over the top of this little flood filled ground area i found that to be better because if you run it this way it, it tends to get there's a danger of it getting trapped the wire getting trapped in that screw hole there and i'll get a little bit of uh, shrink fit tubing there just to make things nice and neat This wire just needs to go to the uh, outer pin on the jack. The one at the far right. It safely avoids that uh, screw hole there. So that's our Luma wire. And we just need the Chroma wire. 
and this one needs no resistor at all. On the previous video I made about this particular modification, uh, I did specify a, a low value capacitor uh, on the chroma. You might find you need that, you probably won't. Now the uh, chroma position here is right here on this little pad here. So I'm just going to hook that wire up to that one. There we go. And we will snake it around up here. And of course this wire needs to go to the one that we separated from the ground pin earlier on. We'll just trim that to size. I like to twist the wire like this before I tin it because it just avoids the situation of uh, all the little strands becoming uh, unraveled. If you have an awkward time um, soldering it to the pin, more, more usually it's when I'm poking the wire through the um, through a veer on the board that there's a danger of that happening. Uh, not so much with stuff like this. Okay, so there's our two wires. Hopefully, hopefully we're not going to end up with a picture that's a bit too dark or anything, uh, just because of the this one of the resistors being slightly out of spec. I've got a funny feeling that that 3.3k resistor is going to be too much and it's going to darken the picture. Uh, but we'll see. If that happens, I'll hunt around and order one. I usually pick up stuff like resistors on uh, eBay just for quickness, but uh, I didn't see. It's just an unusual value 3k so let's swap the cables around so i'm going to pull out the composite cable and i'm going to put in wherever it's gone the s video cable and we shall see what we get hopefully it'll look a bit nicer than the composite signal so let's turn it on again got a signal and there we are, there's a picture, We've got our ready prompt. Um, I'm thinking it's possibly a bit dark. The colour looks fine, so the uh, adjustment pot doesn't really need any attention. But it is a bit on the dark side. I'm going to have a look at the schematic actually, just to see if it's likely that that substituted component has resulted in the picture being a tad dark. Maybe I'll find something a little closer. Uh, or otherwise I'll just rob rob the part off the other board. Right, so this is the bill of materials if you like. Now the resistor in question that's different is that one, R138. Three, it's supposed to be 3K, I've used a 3.3K. So if we go over to the schematic, so here's the schematic anyway. I had a bit of a faff on getting this open. Um, the open broadcaster won't pick up the, uh, the photos app in Windows. Uh, but here's R138 over here in the, in the corner. I'm trying to deduce, with using my limited understanding, what uh, effect that might actually have on picture brightness. It's hard to say. Uh, the Luma outputs are coming through CD4050 here, and then they're going along here, they're going through the transistors, and so the composite, obviously it's a blend of the two signals, you've got luminance and chrominance. I might just, to satisfy my own curiosity, I might just take the part off the other board just to see if it makes any difference. So we'll, we'll, we'll go ahead and give that a try. And if it doesn't make any difference, then fair enough. It doesn't make any difference. Right, so I've swapped that resistor. I've put the proper 3K value in. It's a bit, bit subjective. It's probably hard to tell on camera, but I think it looks a bit brighter and a bit nicer anyway. Um, because the, the, the ambient light's very bright in here, but... That looks normal to me. That looks quite acceptable. So with that out of the way, we're now going to do the 64K RAM upgrade on this machine. And I've just been back on eBay to order more uh, 41464D RAMs because I only had three left, but you only need two for this modification anyway. Right, so we'll quickly run through this 64K mod. Uh, we're going to take both of these DRAMs out. These are the 41416 chips of which I have a tremendous collection now. They're absolutely useless. And then we're gonna immediately replace them with the bigger 
DRAMs, the 41464, four times 64 kilobit. And these were quite nice DRAMs at the time to, to appear in such an early revision machine. These didn't show up again until the late revision um, XEs, the two chip or the four chip 130 XEs. So these, I'm assuming these uh, were pretty expensive at the time, which is probably why the thing came with 16K. Right, so the next thing we need to lift the front of this resistor. There's a couple of different ways of doing this modification. I, I like this way of doing it. Uh, of course, this with this resistor being big, it's making life a little bit difficult when it comes to lifting it up. And normally I just yank it out the board. There we go, so it's up. And we straighten the end of that leg out a bit. And this is where we are going to get our extra address line, or one of them. We're gonna attach a wire to this uh, resistor here, and we are going to attach it to pin eight of the, uh, what is it? LS for LS 51 74 LS 51 so we're going to lift this up if we can get it out there we go I should probably get a proper chip puller for these things so we'll get this out and we're going to lift up pin 8 which is up here and make it nice and flat out the side there we are going to snip off the end because you're never gonna un you're never gonna want to undo this modification unless this is your only 600 XL and you want to sell it and pretend it's in original condition. So we'll tin that, and we're gonna run a wire between those two positions. So we've got some shrunk tubing, we've got some wire. This is a really quick modification. I mean, I have to be honest, the building the video circuit was pretty fiddly. It was just time consuming, but this uh, RAM. Uh, mod doesn't take long at all probably the most time consuming thing about this is just dressing up the wires a little bit so that it looks nice I think right so tin this right and getting the, the wire the lengths of the wires so that they're not too long and they're not too short etc et that's probably the most time consuming part of this right so Put our shrink tubing on here. I mean, this is way, way, way long, um, but I just want to get the shrink tubing on, get that shrunk down, because that's going to help us to route the wire in a nice fashion. Right, so that, and then we can immediately bend that round. Pop the chip back in and root this so that it's going to come round something like that. That would be quite nice. And strip it. Strip it, twist it, tin it, shrink tubing, solder it on. Right, I've just took that chip out again just so I've got better access when I'm actually soldering this wire on. There we go, that looks fine. I'll slide this down over there. And put the chip back. There we go. And just run that round the front of there like that, and it looks quite okay. Right, so there's another two little connections we need to make here uh, from both of these chips, both of these uh, 74 LS158, and I believe they are decoding the uh, RAM address. And we need two more address lines on there. So we're going to take them off. And we need to bend up a couple of pins on these. This one, it is the sort of on the front. 74 LS158, we need to bend up, I want to get this right as well, this one, which is pin 9, bend that up, snip that one, and on the rear chip, we're going to bend up pin 3, which is this one here, I'm going to bend that up, 
do a piece of flap and I'm going to snip that off like that. So this is the rear chip and then I'm going to tin it like so and we need to clear two vias uh, on the board uh, these ones down here on the right hand side of this little bunch of four so we're going to clear the solder out of these little fellas and this is where we're going to attach our two wires the left via goes to the rear chip which is actually closer to the left so that's fairly easy to remember so this one goes to the left via and the front chip there which is further to the right goes to the right hand via so hopefully we can get the solder out of these two vias without any fuss and of course we can't <laughs> oh dear. of course it's going to be awkward so we'll have to go in through the back yeah, we're going to have to break out the desoldering gun here All right, so that's heated up now so hopefully Fingers crossed, this is going to be a simple case of sucking the solder out of this bloody hole. And it is, it's, uh, yeah, it's come out. So what we'll do here is we poke that through there. And that went through no problem at all. Where's my little bit of uh, blue tack? It's very, very useful, this stuff. So I'm going to use the blue tack to just pin that wire to the top of that chip for a minute. And then we know it's not going to move when I flip the board over. There we go. So that's that one. On. But yes, I believe there's a way to do this that requires even less work. Uh, if you prefer that one. I'm just used to doing it this way, so I don't mind. Right, so that's the two wires on. So now we can get some idea of how long they need to be. There we go. So that's the right hand wire on, it's just tucked down in, uh, in front of that uh, socket and the other one is going to go along here, don't think that needs to be quite as long so we'll just snip a little bit off there, pop that there temporarily, oh, don't forget the shrimp tubing. Yes, and I think that looks quite acceptable. Right, so hopefully now when we turn the machine on again, it should boot. And if it boots, then we can delve in a little bit further and see if we get 64 kilobytes. So let's turn her on. And it does indeed boot. Brilliant. So if we get the keyboard, we should be able to hop into the uh, self-test. Or we just do, we could just do a... Um, a free memory command in basic yeah print freo and we get 37902 which means we have 64 kilobytes of base ram so there you go okay so this 600xl motherboard now is functionally identical to an atari 800xl with the chroma connected to the monitor jack so uh, we could just stop there but uh, as it happens, the customer wants the uh, ultimate one megabyte installed in the machine as well. So we'll go ahead and do that. Why, why not? Uh, just for completeness. And then I can put the machine back together and uh, show it off a little bit. Okay, I've gone ahead and uh, installed the ultimate one megabyte in the board here. Nothing to report other than the fact that I took uh, really did take extra care uh, when positioning these two screw holes at the back here just so that I didn't go near any traces I've had, sometimes had to do a bit of micro surgery because it's a, it's a very very tight squeeze there But in this case there was no problem. Well, we'll find out when we turn it on of course, but one thing I will show you because I've revised the um, Connection locations a little bit for the uh, four extra signals that the ultimate needs I used to take I, th I think it was read right from a via right in the front of this standoff here 
it was very very awkward and I had to cut a notch in the standoff it was a, it, it wasn't an ideal place to take the signal from I've picked it up from somewhere else now when I refitted my own 600XL the other week I found a better pick off location for that so I'm just going to make up the little four way uh, DuPont connector and I'll show you where I take the signals uh, on this particular model okay so I've finished installing the ultimate one megabyte and I'm very pleased with it actually it's, uh, it's gone in very nicely and as I mentioned earlier I would show you some of the uh, alternative locations that I used for some of the ultimate one megabyte signals so normally uh, with the ultimate one megabyte most of the signals I've taken them from this area near the PBI um, but since one of them um, I think it was the read write signal the VIA is right in front of the pile on there the little standoff and I had to cut a notch in it and it was a bit of a tight squeeze, so I've sourced some alternative um, VS down the front. Holt always came from down here, because that's pretty much shared between the CPU and Antic. So uh, this one at the top here is uh, read-write, uh, which is a much more convenient uh, spot, as I say. It's right out of the way, that standoff. And the one at the bottom here is reset. And cable length isn't really critical for those things. So I've just ended up putting this little loom of three wires and threading it under some... Uh, resistor legs there and it looks reasonably neat and I've tucked this at the back here around the back of the board uh, so that it just keeps out of the way of the cartridge doors I'll probably have to push this down a little bit as well because it is very cramped in here really but it all looks quite nice I think and uh, quite neat and uh, I have powered it on to test it uh, and it did boot straight away so that's good so I'll put the motherboard back in the case plug the keyboard back in and uh, we can take it for a little spin. The only other thing I might end up doing is replacing the uh, 74LS08 chip here with a with an F08 chip. If side three happens to have any problems with this system, I think it's probably worth doing just in case the owner happens to want to use such a device in the future. I don't know if he is or not, uh, but it certainly won't hurt. But we, we'll see if it works with the stock chip first before we make any changes. I did find the um, the screw and the, the nut for, for the missing strain relief on the right hand side of the SIO connector as well. It was in a little bag of uh, screws and nuts in the box uh, that came with the computer so that's back on now so that's good. So we've got the keyboard plugged back in let's see if the lid goes down properly and it does. So there we go. Let's plug the power and our new monitor jack in. Yes, I definitely employed some good skills here uh, when I came to plug the monitor in to the back of the computer. Of course, what I forgot to do is cut the hole for the new monitor jack. So uh, I was just confronted with this wall of plastic when I tried to plug the jack in. When I came to cut the hole, I didn't record uh, narration. Uh, I just wanted to get to work on it basically and get it done. So here you can see I'm measuring up the hole on the reference case, I think it was 16 and a half millimeter diameter. And uh, I'm going to transfer that uh, using a circle template onto the uh, the case that we're actually going to cut. So as you can see, it's a case of measure twice, cut once. Uh, that's the idea here. So this is the case we're actually going to cut. Uh, as you can see, I've marked off the diameter of the hole. Horizontally, it's going to just completely cover the the slot that was for the RF channel switch and now I'm marking off horizontally uh, relative to the hole for the power jack uh, where the hole needs to go vertically obviously it's exactly the same size as the the hole for the power jack well that's that's the intention anyway I'm using this blue marker pen it obviously it's easy to see and it just rubs off with um, IPA uh, once we're done double checking the height should be 16 and a half uh, the step drills you can see in the corner, I don't actually have one that uh, has half millimetre increments. So I think I end up using a, uh, the, the whole end up cutting, I think it's going to be 17 millimetres. But you'd you'd have to actually, uh, you'd be hard pressed to tell the difference actually looking at it. Um, now I've found this uh, orange plastic template, that wouldn't lie flat on the plastic um, so it was going to be a bit janky, but I did have a look next door. As you can see, I'm using the 17 millimeter hole because, of course, the the width of the pen, it's going to actually make the the hole that uh, is drawn about half a millimeter smaller. So the hole is going to be marked out of the correct size. So since I couldn't get the orange template flat 
on the back of the case uh, with the 17 millimeter hole I've gone in the spare room and I've had a look and I've managed to find a blue plastic template uh, which I'm just checking if it'll actually fit in the correct place and as near as damn it it fits uh, at the correct height so I'm going to use the 17 millimeter hole on that template draw around it as I say the width of the the width of the actual pen is going to result in the hole being pretty much 16 and a half millimeters anyway now I wanted to use the step drill you can see the two of them in the corner of the screen uh, but they are very very difficult to, to use sort of uh, from the get-go uh, drilling the entire hole without a jig you really need a workshop drilling jig to use them so what I ended up doing is I went downstairs I dremeled out the bulk of the plastic and then I finished it off uh, the rough cut hole with the step drill starting at about the 15 millimeter mark and then gradually carefully working up to 17 millimeters so I'm back from the kitchen now and uh, I finished cutting the hole uh, with the step drill and I just filed it and sanded it down along the edge just to tidy it up just a little bit and now I'm going to spray isopropyl alcohol onto the plastic and then wipe it down with a bit of kitchen towel just to get rid of the uh, marker pen on the plastic there so I'm certainly pretty happy with that cut now that we've uh, got rid of all the ink but the step drill that I used only goes up in one millimeter increments uh, but that's okay because the slot for the channel switch uh, was intruding on the outside the circumference of the circle a bit. So the fact that the pole is probably half a millimetre uh, wider than it needs to be is actually a good thing here because it's got rid of that little uh, discrepancy. And as usual I finish off by just dipping a cotton bud in some acetone and I just run that round the outside of the hole like that. It seals the plastic and it provides a nice neat finish so if we put the motherboard in now uh, we should see that it more or less lines up. So the motherboard's in and as you would expect it's an absolute perfect fit and as I say if, I, if it wasn't for the fact that it's probably at the bottom end it's probably half a millimeter uh, lower the circumference of the circle uh, probably half a millimeter wider than it needs to be I don't think you could tell that that wasn't factory um, of course you've also got the channel legend uh, underneath there rather than monitor but uh, there's nothing we can do about that we'll just leave that that's an interesting little uh, anomaly but uh, yeah so that's that done took about 25 minutes okay so we're putting the uh, motherboard back in the case here uh, I've got all the nice little screws in very nice uh, very nice case very nice motherboard the keyboard connectors just a little bit fiddly to get in because it's one of those mylar affairs and it's a bit creased at one end but it still seems to work but we'll obviously give the keyboard a full test when we actually get the thing in so we'll be optimistic and put the screws in and assume it's going to work with the case all tied up there we go so that looks rather nice so let's get it all plugged in and we get a picture excellent And the picture is green. Isn't that typical? I've obviously nudged something when I was uh, messing around with it. So I'm going to have to take the back off again and adjust the colour pot. Alright, so adjusting the colour pot's given us blue. I still think that picture looks a bit dark for some reason. Um, I might have to uh, look at that a bit more closely. Right, you join me after I've done some more work on this machine. Um, I wasn't happy with the uh, video at all. Uh, it wasn't just the lighting that was making the thing look dark on the screen. Um, I'll flash some images up, uh, photographs that I took uh, of the problem. When I went into the Ultimate One Megabyte setup screen, which is where I am now, and as you can see, it looks absolutely splendid. Um, there was a lot of um, bleeding luma, um, sort of a ghosting effect, uh, like a, a, sort of like a smudge going across the right-hand side of the screen. Uh, which looked really bad. It wasn't so noticeable on the default blue uh, graphics uh, zero screen But it was very very noticeable here. So I gave um, Candle a shout. Thanks to Candle I have to say uh, for being very responsive very quickly and Candle suggested that the uh, Luma was uh, underpowered or had too much capacitance. So I began to meticulously go over the work that I'd done um, full of self-doubt thinking maybe I put the wrong value capacitor somewhere but no I, I 
changed a few transistors just to be on the safe side, rubbed them off a spare board just to be 100% sure that they were the right parts. No difference whatsoever, absolutely nothing. I spent about an hour and a half doing that. And uh, I've got the oscilloscope here and I was just about at the point where I was going to start making measurements with the spare machine to try and compare signals and voltages laboriously which would have taken even longer. But I had a look at something just out of sheer total desperation. I'll turn the machine off here and show you. So for some reason I don't know why it's just one of those happy accidents sometimes um, that happens. Um, I'd, I'd remarked on these capacitors before on this board um, thinking that the this one seemed particularly unusual um, and it's on a different uh, set of VS to the ones I'm normally used to seeing. I also, also removed, I'm not too sure what it's actually for, I think it's probably to do with the RF modulator. It's not present on PAL boards but R140. Uh, I just wanted the thing to be as close to identical as the um, the, the sort of reference machine I was looking at. I've taken that resistor off, uh, but it didn't fix the problem anyway. And that you'll find that one's not present on PAL machines. So I'd be very interested to know what R140 is for and why it is present on NTSC boards and not PAL boards. But anyway, there was a there's a decoupling capacitor C115. Is it C115? I'll just check the schematic. Uh, yes, yeah, C115 down here. Now, this was one of these blue capacitors, like this one here. And I just had the thought with what Candle had suggested. Um, and I've run into this problem as well with, a, with another machine, um, an 800XL, where I had no picture whatsoever and no sync signal. And it turned out to be a bad choke next to CD4050. Now, CD4050 provides all the luminance signals uh, which eventually get mixed into the video circuit here and produce the luma signal and it just suddenly occurred to me i didn't actually get right well, i was just about to the point of having a look at the five volt supply on this chip bearing in mind what candle said about the uh, undervolted luminance if you like uh, maybe this capacitor this decoupling capacitor was going bad or had gone bad and if it was feeling short it would obviously it would drag the voltage down on the chip so I popped that, that this is the capacitor in question, I took it out and I found a new one and popped it in and what do you know, we've got now perfect video. The display is visibly brighter, um, it doesn't quite show up as much on camera but the, in person that is vibrantly bright and looks really really nice. So I think uh, we can put the board back in the case now. Okay so when we power on now we should get nice video no problems there we go so that looks a lot brighter as i said happy with that so far we'll have a quick look at the ultimate bios setup screen uh, i think that is quite acceptable i've left um rf connected here um i better check actually while we're about it i should check composite video which we can check by just pulling the s video cable out the back I mean, composite looks absolutely hideous, but <laughs> it works. Um, oh, I was going to try the self-test as well. I'm looking for any weird behavior. I replaced the other, uh, an, an adjacent capacitor of the same brand on the motherboard, because I figured if one's gone, possibly the other one's on the way out as well. There we go, so right by. Yeah, that looks nice. I think that's nice. So we pop the side cartridge in. Now we should. Just boot to the side loader with a bit of luck. Yeah, and that seems to be working fine, so it doesn't look like there's any need to, no immediate need to change the 74 LSO8 chip. So there we go. Lovely little machines, these. So I guess I'll end the video with a montage of uh, beauty shots of the computer because it looks really, really nice. I'm happy with this, the way it's turned out. I think it looks factory fresh. It was in nice condition when it came here, but now it's got a lot more functionality it's got a megabyte of ram in it nice looking stock video and i'm sure the owner is going to be absolutely over the moon with it so as ever i want to thank the patrons uh, in particular for uh, their support uh, and the sponsor uh, and indeed everybody who watches the videos engages with them it's all very greatly appreciated indeed 
and uh, so I look forward to bringing you uh, lots of interesting videos as I work through the queue. So rather than waffle on any further, we've got to get on with the next one. So um, I'll thank you again and uh, I hope to see you in the next video. So bye bye for now. Mm -hmm.